Hello, and welcome to Save Your Sanity Podcast. I'm Dr. River British Shaler. In this episode, we're going to talk about something that I haven't talked about before in these very straightforward terms. I'm going to give you straightforward information on four types of narcissistic behavior and three degrees that some of it happens in. And it's important to know these things because if you understand the differing places that people engage in narcissistic behavior and the differing ways that it shows up, then you can calibrate what's happening in the relationships that you're concerned about. And it will help you to make healthy, health-affirming choices um, and decisions about what should happen in those relationships and how to keep yourself safe. That's very, very important. And so we're going to start by talking about these four types of narcissism and if you've been enjoying the podcast, and I hope you have, I hope you'll consider um, supporting the podcast. You can do that simply by going to patreon.com slash save your sanity. You can support it with a dollar, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. They're a one-time donation, but we appreciate that if you're finding value here. And be sure to tell your friends as well. Invite them to come along. Everybody can benefit from having this information. It doesn't matter whether you're currently in a toxic relationship, but you want to know what they look like, don't you? So that you can avoid them. Know what to do with them when they show up in the workplace. What if a friend or a new friend shows these signs and red flags? Are you ready to do something about that? If you're not, because you haven't been educated, then you may not see them and you could get into a deep, dark place. So it's valuable to know the things that I talk about on Save Your Sanity, whether or not you are experiencing them at the moment. So very important. And remember that you can always go to forrelationshiphelp.com. That's my website, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com. Okay, so let's get into this. How's it going to help you to know these four types? Well, as I describe them, you'll you'll be surprised at the differences among them, perhaps. And that as I describe them, there will be pieces of them that you say, oh, yes, these three pieces are exactly what's going on in the relationship I'm concerned about. So this will help you see the patterns see how they go together. Then at the toward the end, I'll talk about these degrees of narcissistic behavior that I have developed so that you can learn a little bit more about what I have learned in that regard. And then you can put it all together for yourself so you can see, am I in a narcissistic relationship? What kind of a relationship and I, am I in? What are the tendencies of the person who has the narcissistic behaviors? And are they all right with me on any level? Are they all right with me? So uh, let's carry on. The first one is the one that is the classic. It's the one that we think of most often when we think of narcissistic behavior. So I want to make a distinction before I jump in that people who have narcissistic tendencies or narcissistic behaviors are not necessarily diagnosable with narcissistic personality disorder. So it is inaccurate to call them narcissists. These are people who have narcissistic tendencies. So, you know, I kind of gave you a new title for those folks so that you could talk about them without making a clinical diagnosis of narcissism. And that, of course, is my term hijackals, which we can use is these are the behaviors and traits, patterns and cycles that hijackals also have. And for those who haven't heard my term hijackals before, it's defined this way. Hijackals are people who hijack relationships for their own purposes and then relentlessly scavenge them for power, status, and control. And for those of you who've been listening to that, me for a while, you could probably recite that along with me, but that's good because it reminds you. So let's look at the classic one, the grandiose one, the, the one that you expect, the one who is arrogant and the one who is 
uh, always wanting the spotlight. In fact, hogging the spotlight, grabbing the spotlight, shining it just on them. And if you have a success in life, they don't want to celebrate unless they get some referent glory from it. So even if you're celebrating something really important to you, they will do something to divert the attention back to them. This is a grandiose narcissist. So they're boastful and they're self-absorbed and they're entitled. They believe that everything should happen for them in the way that they want it. And who are you to have a different want? You are supposed to want what I want because I am the most important person in the room. And they're exploitative and they're aggressive. They, they, they're quite overt in their behavior many times, the ones that we think of as the classic narcissistic person because they are larger than life, they are demanding, they make assumptions, they make presumptions, they push their way to the front, they're always demanding attention, and they're confident, so we like that about them, they're confident, they're self-satisfied, they, um, they believe that their needs should override everybody else's needs. Um, it's just a given with them. They'll steamroller over anything. And they're quite distrustful of other people. So these grandiose narcissistic types become kind of the archetype when we think of it. And unfortunately, there are other kinds as well that are maybe not quite as obvious, but are just as insidious. They will wear you down, tear you down, and put you down, no matter which of these types of narcissistic behaviors we're talking about. So it's important then to know the distinctions just because that gives you a broader view of all things narcissistic. So do you have someone in mind, maybe that grand person, that grandiose person who always has to be right and always at the front of the line and always, what about me? That would be a very classic, grandiose, narcissistic set of traits. So that's important to notice because they're a little more obvious than the others. And Sometimes if you've been raised in a home where you have been taught to uh, be compassionate, go the extra mile, uh, give first, um, all of those things, these people will see you coming and take advantage of you quickly because they see you as a potential follower. They see you as someone already groomed to meet their needs, to put them first. So they will, they will find you attractive and you may be happy to have them find you so it's a match made in heaven but it soon deteriorates to somewhere a lot lower <laughs> so it's important to see that now the second category of narcissistic tendencies and traits is vulnerable narcissists now these are the ones who are more covert although Overt and covert exist in all of these, but these are the ones that are more covert. These are the ones who are kind of under the radar because they like to play the victim. And they're, so they're a little more subtle and they, they're equally self-absorbed and they're equally lacking in empathy. Maybe I didn't mention that about the grandiose narcissists. They, they do have an empathy deficit for sure, because putting themselves in your shoes, which is empathy to know how you're experiencing life is something that they question, like, why should I do that? I, I, it's all about me. Why should I put myself in your shoes? That's a waste of my precious time. So you find that empathy also is lacking in a vulnerable narcissist. They're more insecure. They tend to be less happy. They're passive. They tend to be quite defensive. And they love to play the victim. Nobody ever cares what I want. No, go ahead. Do what you want to do because I don't matter. And you hear these things over and over and over. <laughs> and you think, 
oh, it pulls at your heartstrings, which is just what it's intended to do. And they like to blame you. They don't have a lot of autonomy in their life. They, they're pretending that they are being driven to be less than they're being put down they're they're the ones who are doing all of this and it's very covert it's hidden and they have a big fear of criticism so they try to stay in the background they don't allow themselves to be out there to be criticized it doesn't make them less self-centered and self-absorbed they're still very concerned about themselves getting what they want um, but they do it in a more covert way they complain about what they never get as opposed to what they want and they will play on your heartstrings as i said so if you have been taught to go the extra mile for someone um, to always be looking out for the underdog and you happen to meet a vulnerable narcissist a covert vulnerable narcissist you will think oh you've never had a chance no one ever has given you a chance let me be that person and you get into a real caregiving road and that's the way that you have the relationship set up that you will take care of them because they are so hurting and fragile and they will make outrageous demands on you and we get into this horrible give and take where you are doing all the giving and they are doing all the taking but they're complaining that they're never given anything does that sound at all familiar that it, it you just can't seem to stop it it uh, it just is always well, that was great, but I appreciated that, but it could have been more. Nobody ever completely gives me what I want. And so the vulnerable narcissist is just as you would picture that, you know, in the same way you picture grandiose, you know, right out there center stage. And you think of vulnerable narcissist like, oh, poor me. Like, oh, don't hurt me. I'm very fragile. And that's the message that comes across. Now, there is another kind, and this kind is the communal narcissist. Now, this is something that we don't talk about a lot, but I have done a previous podcast on communal narcissists. So if you have an interest in knowing more about that, go to my podcast at saveyoursanitypodcast.com and find that um find the little magnifying glass and just do a search on communal wherever you like to get your podcasts and you'll find that but if you go to save your sanity podcast.com you can search it right in the search bar so go to save your sanity podcast.com and look up the one on communal narcissists to learn more about it but let me tell you a little bit about them they, they want to portray themselves to be the most supportive people in the world, the most supportive, the most helpful, the most self-sacrificing, the most selfless. I would do anything for you, anything at all. But it's to give the impression that they are these very special people. And this is where the narcissistic tendency comes in because they're doing it to prove how special they are. And they're doing that proving of specialness by indicating that, you know, I will do anything. I will put myself 80th to make you first. I will wear my fingers to the bone and all of that. But there's a place where it shows up that you might not have even recognized as communal narcissism. Have you ever noticed on Facebook there are some people who just need to tell you of their good deeds all the time? You know, they'll say something like, well, I don't usually post this, but, you know, when I was uh, in in the food, in the restaurant, getting my food, I realized that there was this person there who was looking longingly at the menu. And I, you know, I, I don't like to talk about myself in this way. And I'm not bragging, I'm not tooting my own horn, but you know, it just pulled at my heartstrings. And so I had a meal with them and we sat and talked. Now, yes, a one-off situation where that happens once in a blue moon for somebody, great. 
no communal narcissistic tendencies. But if you notice people repeatedly telling you what they did for other people, what they did for the community, where they got awards, where they got awards for being that supportive, wonderful, self-sacrificing person, then you can start to think, whoa, what's really going on here? You know, we're only talking about tendencies here. We're not diagnosing anybody, but you start to see that. Have you seen that? Have you noticed that? Does it somehow strike you as disingenuous sometimes? Now, that would be your radar picking up this communal narcissistic tendency that I can couch my good works by being supposedly and portraying myself as humble and then telling a good story so that you will think better of me because I have been this wonderful sacrificing person. And that gets very engaging and people say, oh, that's wonderful. Aren't you kind? Aren't you? And yes, that's true. For a person who does that, they are kind, they are giving. But if they have to report it, it loses a little something in translation, doesn't it? If you have to tell of your good works all the time, if you have to include stories about how you were actually the hero over and over and over, that is a sign of communal narcissism. Endeavoring to elevate yourself in the community, but by doing something that on the surface looks very good, but then you wonder about the motives. And that's where the communal narcissistic tendencies come in that they're doing it for the notice of being good, not because of who they are necessarily, but because it gets them notice and makes them the center of attention in a very covert way. And yet it's overt when it shows up on social media. So then it certainly isn't covert. But you may not have picked up on that one, or you may have just had that uncomfortable feeling like this isn't sitting very well with me. This keeps showing up from this person. And that can be an example of communal narcissism. And so then we have grandiose and we have vulnerable, we have communal. And then the last one, the big kahuna here is the malignant narcissist. These are dark people. These are people with dark intent. These are people who actually want to hurt you and maybe are happy to hurt you. Malignant, you know, just like a cancer tumor, it's going to grow, it's going to fester, it's going to cover other things, it's going to travel to other parts of life, it's going to eventually take you over and perhaps be your demise. So, not hard to remember the name a malignant narcissist. And they're the cruelest ones there are, and they're aggressive. They're ruthlessly aggressive. They will push and push and they don't care who they hurt. They don't care who they step over. They will even overtly say that it doesn't matter what happens to other people because it gets me what I want. They're very, very clear about that. On the other hand, they're paranoid that is everybody on board with me? Everybody agrees with me, right? I am the, don't you dare not agree with me. Don't, don't you dare because I'll crush you like a gnat. Um, they tend to be sadistic. They'll have no problem stepping outside anybody's moral compass. <laughs> they just don't have a problem with that. They will do whatever it is to reach their goals and to push them forward and on top of the pile. They treat everybody as though they are subservient to them and that they don't matter. They like loyalty, but they will never give you loyalty. They demand loyalty from you in many cases. If you want to be around me, you have to be 100% loyal, but they'll throw you under the bus in a heartbeat, even if you've been the most loyal person to them forever. And there you are saying, but I did so much for you, and they are off with your head, sort of like the, the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, you know, off with their heads. <laughs> And that, that's the way that um, malignant narcissist rolls. And, and they, they love to create chaos and fog and confusion. They say something, then they say they didn't say something, and then they say you took what they said wrong, and then that, that rolls into your dumb, you don't listen, it, you're stupid, and then they 
go for the kill again. They will be sadistic and cruel and aggressive. And so it is it is something that just grows and grows in the relationship, gets all over you, and you start shrinking if you stay in the relationship because they are taking up so much space that that you just keep shrinking. And notice that because these are the most deceptive. Narcissistic people can be deceptive. They lie with ease. They, they like to manipulate in different degrees depending on the kinds of narcissistic behavior. But the malignant narcissist is the most deceptive, the most manipulative, the cruelest. And these are very important because they love to get power by ruining other people's lives. Can you imagine living like that? That you love to get power by ruining the lives of other people. Well, that's the malignant narcissist. And when you see it in action, it is head spinning. Because once you see what's actually going on, you just have to shake your head at it. Like, oh, there it is. Those are the patterns. That's what they're doing. And when you can step away and have a perspective on it, things can improve because then you see the game. You see, you see the, the way that they go about manipulating you. Just like master puppeteers, the malignant narcissists particularly like that role. I can make you do anything and nobody knows I'm up here pulling all the strings. So when they get found out, they are furious, just furious. There is wrath like you have never seen raining down on absolutely everyone. And no one is safe from the malignant narcissist. You've got to stay out of their path. And then they blame you for staying out of their path. So it's a very, very difficult one. So if you are anywhere near someone who has malignant narcissistic tendencies or behaviors, you really want to see them clearly. And that's why I wanted to make the distinctions among these four kinds of narcissistic behavior um, so that you could see you're not going to diagnose them, but you're going to know better what you're dealing with. And when you can step back and see that that's the case, you know, I've said many times on the podcast, I was raised by two hijackals. They were very different from one another. They were both very passive aggressive, of course, because almost all hijackals start, start by being very passive aggressive, but they were very deceptive. They, I had one who was definitely in the sort of vulnerable communal, that was my father, and my mother was more borderline, but she showed a lot of narcissistic tendencies, and it was really difficult to discern whether she was actually a borderline or she was narcissistic in the more, well, not grandiose, but in a very declarative I'm right kind of way, not malignant, not cruel and nasty. Although, of course, my experience of her was she was cruel and nasty, but in the world, she didn't appear cruel and nasty, but she definitely was opinionated and other people were less than she. So all of these things are part of that. Now, there's one other thing. I will do a podcast on it by itself because it's so important. But there is something beyond these four categories, which is called the dark triad. And these are the worst of the worst of the worst. I just want to put it in here in case you have run into this. And these are are the people in the dark triad who contain the traits of three things. They contain narcissistic traits, psychopathic traits, and Machiavellian traits, meaning that the means always justifies the end, and the end justifies the means. So to get what I want, I can do anything. I can be as ruthless as I care to be. That's Machiavellian. But the psychopathic psychopathy or the psychopathic part of that is that there is absolutely no empathy. It cannot even be, in some cases, cannot even be mustered up and pretended to exist. And then there are the narcissistic people pieces that I've been talking about tonight. And you put that into that dark triad 
and you you get those three areas all working at the same time and it is so soul crushing it is so nasty it is so difficult and so terrible that I will devote a podcast to it so that you can hear more about it a little later on in and maybe in a few weeks. So we have these four types of narcissistic behavior that hijackals engage in. And I just want to talk about something that I created when I was creating the idea of hijackals. And there are three degrees of two of these kinds of narcissistic tendencies in the the vulnerable and in the um, communal we will find that there are some degrees of this not so much in the grandiose not definitely not in the malignant but in the communal and the vulnerable we'll find that there are degrees and here's how i define those degrees there are what i call white hat hijackals these are the people who learned to behave in certain ways when they were young and they they don't like themselves when they do it it is the only thing they've ever learned it's the only way they know how to make their like their way in the world but they don't like themselves when they do it and they feel badly and they're apologizing for it but they still do it occasionally so these are the people who are copying a parent or a significant other um person in their life when they were growing up they hate themselves for their behaviors they want help they get help then they're not that's not to be confused with the borderline person but when they get help and they get new strategies and they get new skills and they get new understanding they actually will engage in sustained change so one of the tasks that i have when people come to see me is all right you know what are we actually dealing with here and that's a, that's a really important thing question to ask is what kinds of behaviors can I expect to have changed? So, you know, if you want my insights on what's going on in your specific case, I do offer this uh, new client opportunity for $97 an hour session at beaclient.com. Because if this is ringing some bells for you and you want to know exactly what I'm dealing with, I can help you. So go to beaclient.com. But when we're dealing with white hat hijackals, they can change. They will change when I give them a new skill set, when they see compelling reasons, when they, they learn how to not do the nasty things and feel so much better about themselves. And then in that same category, just within the vulnerable and community nar communal narcissists are the gray hat hijackal, and this is the one that has infrequent displays of the behaviors, of the narcissistic behaviors. Infrequent, maybe when they're just truly stressed or when they're really feeling pressure from outside to behave in a particular way or the pressures of the world are, are too heavy for them or there's some major event that occurs. And so they will have an infrequent display. Or maybe it's just in one or two tender areas in their life that they just can't tolerate talking about and they just won't have it and they will pounce on you if you talk about it. So these can be either uh, mitigated by coming in and we talk about it with the, with the two people that can often open some avenues up, but it also helps us to see what is immovable and then the partner of that person can say, is that okay? Can I tolerate that or can I not? And a gray hat hijackal will present, as I said, just occasionally, maybe infrequently, maybe twice a year, three times a year, but it's big. It'll make a big fuss. Um, but the rest of the time, things are relatively okay enough. So there is that. And then there's, of course, the black hat hijackal. And this is a full-blown narcissistic person with usually some malignant traits. And nothing, nothing, nothing I can say, you can say, or the world can say will change them. They will not change. Now, they may come in with you to see me because their intent is to think that because they are on top of the pile and the smartest person in every room, they will come in with you to see me, but their intent 
is to manipulate me, to seduce me, to charm me into believing that their view of the relationship is the accurate view and that I should join with them in making you wrong. And this is why if you suspect narcissistic tendencies in someone, this is why you must go to a person who specializes in narcissistic wounds and narcissistic relationships because otherwise they may not see it. I was working with a client today who said she'd been to several therapists who were wonderful and could help her with childhood issues, could help her with communication, do all kinds of things, but they never saw what she was dealing with at home. They just glossed it over. They would not see it. They didn't have a pattern for it and they didn't have expertise for it. That's what makes it very important to go to someone like myself who specializes in that area. So I've given you four types of narcissistic behavior and three degrees of vulnerable and communal narcissistic behavior that um, we can understand. Be sure that you do not minimize hijackal traits. I know that you may like to trivialize them or rationalize them or justify them, but what that does when you do that is you are enabling them and you're not allowing what you actually see and what you actually feel to have meaning, to have weight. You are giving in to the narcissistic tendencies of another person. So be careful not to minimize, minimal, mim, <laughs> minimize narcissism, <laughs> minimize narcissistic tendencies, minimize the degree to which a person is a hijackal, because we do have a tendency to downplay it and think that white hats are, act, are, are all of them um, and that no, no, I couldn't possibly have a black hat hijackal in my life. No, no, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I, I want to do all of that. And I really invite you to see it as it is, to whip off your rose-colored glasses so you can actually see those red flags that are there all the time and be able to say, ah, yeah, I get it. I see. And that tonight's has been a, a good insight for you to see these different things and to be able to calibrate what's going on in your relationships. Because if you have one hijackal, it's usual that you begin to understand that you've had a few more. And there's always a reason for that. I can help you so that you will steer clear of them and know what to do with them should you happen to fall over one. But in the meantime, curb your enthusiasm for, for them by having a reality check. And that reality check always comes in the form of ABB, my formula. And I know those of you who've been listening to me for a long time know what ABB is. So we'll say it together. Always believe behavior. Never believe the words unless they match the behavior. Always believe behavior. So I hope this has been helpful. And until we talk again, take very good care of yourself because you're precious and you matter. Talk soon. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here and being part of what we had to talk about tonight. And if it rang any bells, be sure to ask any questions you have about toxic relationships. If particularly you want to talk about these different traits and patterns I've talked about tonight, let's open it up. So let's see. Now, oh, Ting Ting says, hi, hi. <laughs> okay, glad to see you here. And Mark Mark says, they don't blink much and stare intermittently into space at times. Yes, yeah, sometimes they actually do that for sure, Mark. Um they like to appear as though they're thinking. They like to appear as though they didn't hear you. They like to appear as though they don't see you. <laughs> so they will definitely do that because that's a way of blocking you out and being in their own heads. Ting Ting says, last time I attended your live session, you mentioned that the hijackals come back when they're out of supply. Yes, they absolutely do. You know, it... it Supply to them are people who will adore them and validate them, who will put up with their behaviors, who will become subservient to them, who will do their wishes and, uh, you know, 
pretty much just be who they want them to be. Um, and when you have been discarded by a hijackal, um, they will come back. And there is the issue of supply. And supply to them, as I said, are people who will validate them, adore them, put up with them, uh, have sex with them, uh, give them money, take care of them. So they do come back. And it's the old principle that happens in business. You know, it's what we know in business is it's always easier to sell to an existing customer than it is to acquire a new one. And so that's the way supply works. They already know you. And when they get rejected somewhere else or they're feeling like they don't have somebody to adore or validate them, they circle back to people who have previously adored and validated them. So they do come back. And when they come back, they may come just for an evening, or they may start to tell you how much they love you, how sorry they are, they behave badly, and they do all their love bombing stuff to hoover you back in. And the reason that we use the word hoover is, of course, that's the name of a popular vacuum cleaner. So they're just there to suck you back into their maelstrom and use you, but they will come back, ting ting, so watch out about that. And Mark says, most mine have been adopted, fostered only child, angry that their lives were unfair. Okay, well, that certainly happens, and children do have that. I mean, they, they have a lot to be angry about. I used to be in the education system in special ed, and I ended my career in education, although I always had my private practice on the side. I ended my career in education being the acting principal of a school for at-risk teenagers. So I know exactly what you're talking about, Mark. They've been dealt a bad hand. They've had bad modeling. They've been rejected. They've been neglected. And they don't get a fair shake in the world. And they're just angry. They really are. And if they have any underlying tendencies towards having anything of a psychopathic nature, it will really exacerbate. So you will get very, very angry children. But on the whole children in foster care, it is unfair. It's unfair that your parents didn't want you or couldn't help, couldn't help you or couldn't be there for you or whatever caused you to go into foster care. It's just a basic human feeling of unfairness. Then that can turn into anger and resentment very easily. So I understand what you're talking about. I also notice they wear sunglasses all the time and they're into expensive watches, Porsches, and if they can't afford the Porsche and Audi, <laughs> well, they do like the outer trappings of success because it's all part of the look of me culture. You know, how can I keep the eyes on me? How can I keep people envying me? How can I keep people jealous of me? So they want to do that on every level. So you're absolutely right. They, they put on a good show and they want people to notice for sure. So fast cars and fake Rolexes, or even in many cases, real Rolexes, um, all of that kind of thing happens. They, you know, sometimes you'll watch a program like House Hunters or something on TV, and you can see that somebody will walk in and say, this house needs a grand entrance. It must have a grand entrance. It must impress people when they walk in. And they'll be very overt about saying that. And you know where my mind goes at that moment. Ah, I'm going to watch the behavior of this person as they look at the house and how they negotiate with their spouses to which one they're going to buy because they've already told me something about themselves. They want to impress. They need to impress. And that's the same thing that's happening with the fast cars and the the uh, watches and the and the fancy clothes and the designer clothes and the um, skimpy clothes. Sometimes we'll see that, and the need for a lot of plastic surgery. All of that goes in that same bucket. Tini said it was scary. They feel like that is feels like that is psychopathic. Well, it may be. It may be psychopathic. Um, psychopaths have really no empathy. So they don't care who they hurt. They feel their sense of power by hurting other people. They'll go out of their ways to do that. And that is the only uh, antisocial personality that is really seen as clearly having markers in the genetic code. Um, so if a, if a psychopathic person with, or a person with that that DNA code um, 
is in a loving environment, a wonderful environment, sometimes it will never show up. But so often it happens that that code comes by naturally because their parents had it too. And so they're in a neglectful or an adverse childhood experience kind of beginning and it exacerbates it. So yes, that's absolutely true. It is scary. <clears throat> Yes, Ting Ting, that's right. That is what they are. Now, you are not responsible for their upbringing. You didn't break them. You can't fix them. You know, as they like to say, not your circus, not your monkeys. And if you happen to be in the wrong circus, notice that the monkeys are doing you wrong and, and maybe make an escape plan. <laughs> Ting Ting says, my experience being exposed. Whoops to a hijackal and later growth is that the hijackal create fragmented peace in our mental space, pulling us away from being a complete person. Good insight. Absolutely true. They, they take up so much space that you cannot have a straight thought to yourself often, and they want to invade every space. I was working with someone frequently who he put cameras in the whole house, absolutely everywhere. And he had, of course, them going directly to his cell phone and doing all of that. And, and besides that, he would engage in other kinds of electronic surveillance, as I call it, by texting every five minutes, it seemed, when he was out of the house. What are you doing? Where are you doing? What are you wearing? What, you know, <clears throat> all of that. And that just shows that they're, they're constantly invading your mental space and you can't find any peace. And they are very demanding about that. So that happens for sure. And Ting Ting says, I wonder what was happening during their blank stare. Well, <clears throat> they are plotting and planning and blotting you out. Those things for sure are going on. Mark says, mine was exactly like the movie, the talented Mr. Ripley played by Matt Damon. He moved his way to the top, very angry. We questioned if he was in the closet. His adopted family was super religious and he's not. You know, that's very common um, that they claw their way to the top, stepping over other humans, <laughs> um, not caring who they step over or step on. and. Um, they do very well because nobody challenges them. Nobody stands up to them. You know, I, I was giving a, a talk at an, a California HR conference a few years ago, and the room was full. There were about 150 people, and they wanted to know about hijackles in the workplace. And about halfway through, one brave person put up his hand and says, well, what happens to them at work? And I said, brace yourself because they get promoted laterally or vertically they get promoted they're like a reverse ping pong or a pinball machine um they they just instead of get shooting up to the top they don't they just make their way up very slowly um someone gets exacerbated exasperated by having them in their work group so they give them a lateral promotion to get rid of them. That person wants to get rid of them, so they give them a slight vertical promotion. And by people getting rid of them and not wanting them around, they slowly make their way up. And that's very, very sad. Now, you brought up another point here, too. You questioned that they're in the closet. Many times, that's a very viable question uh, because they're overcompensating for something. They don't want to be seen as who they really are. So that's an important question that comes up often. And also the other thing that you said, Mark, that he was adopted by a super religious family. Well, <clears throat> when you get into super religious, it often uh, equates to being repressive and suppressive. And you're not allowed to have your true feelings. And you're not allowed to express yourself. And there are a lot of rules and that doesn't work well for a person with these tendencies. So they will then rebel even more strongly than they might have. So that's important. The ambient calm channel. Hi. And this person says, hi, everybody. Love your content. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you find the content useful. And, and uh, please come again. I haven't seen you before. 
And Mark says they always borrow money. And if they ever pay you back, it's like 20 to 50% less. And they don't even say anything. Oh, that's so true. You know, go ahead. Ask me where the rest of the money is. I dare you. That's a hijackal kind of thing. Um, no thinking. Just stare to see your reaction. A CEO mother son team defrauded us. Yeah, that's what they do. What can I get away with, sucker? You know, go ahead, call me on my behavior. I'll swat you like an at. And they're just daring you to speak up, to say something about the inequity or the lack of reciprocity or mutuality. And then they will take you apart and and leave you in a crumbling mat mess if they possibly can. That's what they do. And they have power over you. Hi, Ernesto. I'm glad to see you here. Sandy says, they don't do anything but have a judgment for everything. And if others shares their opinion, then they manipulate and lie to others. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. And they will lie about the silliest things. You've probably noticed that, you know, I've done, I've done a show on the 10 things about pathological liars. Uh, but hijackers lie about dumb stuff. <laughs> There's no need to lie. Just in pathological lying, many of the things that they lie about have no need to have a lie. But but people with narcissistic tendencies lie to make themselves feel better. They lie to have a better story. They lie to impress you. They will lie for so many things. So it's important that you notice that for sure. And I'm glad you did, Sandy. I'm glad you brought it up. And that is how they manipulate others because they dare you to catch them in the lie and adjust the story back to the truth. And when you don't, they get away with it. And then they continue to manipulate the story as well. So that's problematic. Now, just as we go on, for those of you who've been here before, but especially for those who haven't, know that when you put a comment or ask a question, when you hit send, it takes 20 seconds at least to get to me. So how I calibrate when to end this conversation is when there have been 30 seconds with no more questions or comments. So now would be a good time if you're going to or thinking about asking a question or making a comment to do it. And, oh, here's a good one. Mark says they are act morally superior and self-righteous in public. Galas, charities, with your money. But then they treat you crappy alone. Mine went after all my girlfriends, gave them horrible HPV, and he didn't even care. Oh, Mark, you're just full of examples of malignant narcissists and classic grandiose mar uh, narcissistic behavior. These are the hallmarks that you've been bringing up. So you certainly have met one or two, and you know these things to watch out for because you're absolutely on the money. That's exactly what happens. So Ernesto, hi, I, I thought you might comment on the sound. Ernesto helped me with some sound issues a while ago. So he says, you sound well now, almost ready for the opera, I would say. <laughs> uh, well, that's good to know. And uh, he thanked me for sharing the knowledge. And you're always welcome, Ernesto. That's what floats my boat and flips my skirt, is to help people see what's going on in hijackal land. Stella, hi. After being with a hijackal, I feel everyone is a hijackal. Yeah, that's something that happens. It, they raise your fear level, don't they, Stella? So you you don't you're on high alert all the time. Are these red flags? Are these red flags? Is is that what's happening? Always know that you need to see a pattern, not just an individual red flag. Stay, give someone the benefit of the doubt, and still they they show you three red flags. And then you start to see a pattern because when you've been deeply hurt by a hijackal, everybody is suspect. I know that that's true. You want to be safe. You don't want to be taken advantage of. You don't want to find yourself in another poor relationship. So you're very, very careful about that. And you're in good company. So many people feel that same way. Is there another one? Is there another one around the corner? You know, in the new programs and the new 
empowered, uh, emerging empowered community that I've built. I'm going to be launching courses to help you understand those things. There are a lot of courses there now for you, and you can go to joinintoday.com joinintoday.com and be part of the community. It's only $19 a month and it's new. It's just building. So there are not many people there. So jump in while you get more of my attention. Um, but one of the things that membership gives you is two group Ask Me Anything calls with me each month. Now, other people have to pay $25 to come to one class. But for a $19 a month membership, you get to come to two a month. And that's a big plus. Plus, it's all on my website. So all the discussion and everything is happening on my website, which is totally secure. And nobody can find you. And uh, not like on Facebook, <laughs> you don't have to worry. It's completely private. So <clears throat> yes, I understand what you're saying, Stella. After you've been with the hijackal, you get concerned that how many else, uh, how many others are there out there? <laughs> Absolutely. Lily, I've always said that they are so large and want everyone else to be invisible, to take up the space and have no needs. Yes, they do want to take up all the space. You know, they want to marginalize you, put you, push you to the edges of the earth so they can have all of the space. That's exactly what they like to do. And they want you to just be subservient to their needs, their wants, their ideas, their plans. And they make you wrong when you're not. So true. Mark said, I had to see a shrink since 2012, since we lost all our saving from the fraud. Hmm, maybe you met somebody like Bernie Madoff. Just listening to these videos makes me tremble. The CPTSD they give you lasts so long, it's hard to move on. Yes, and let me just say, for those of you who may not have heard the term CPTSD, that stands for Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. And complex PTSD comes from emotional abuse. It comes from other kinds of abuse being added to it, but primarily being worn down, torn down, and put down by verbal and emotional abuse over a long period of time. PTSD will come from a traumatic event, but it is the systemic long-term nature of being in an emotionally abusive relationship that creates a complex PTSD, PTSD pattern. I'm sorry you had to go through that, Mark. It's really difficult, and I know that it's hard to recover from. And Mark went on to say, mine were really big into military. Oh, yes, power over. Always stand with military or authority. Expect respect when not deserved. I've been through a lot. One shot me in my sleep with a flare gun. Ah, oh, Mark, you have been through it all. That is really sad. I'm sorry that that happened to you because it colors your whole world for such a long time. I hope you're getting some good help for that. Mark says, and this is the last comment in the list, so if you have something, a question that's burning, make sure to pop it in there and hit send fast. Mark says, oh, somebody did. <clears throat> Mark says, when I found the videos on YouTube about narcissism, that's what helped me get away. I found I was codependent. Those videos saved lives. I have heard many people who have been kind enough to write to me to tell me what their experience has been and that they were either watching my YouTube channel or listening to my podcast. And it was what allowed them to take action and realize what was going on in their lives. So I know that you're right. And Sandy says, this is the last comment. It's so difficult to live with them and sharing space when you know what they really are. Oh, yes, it is. As you mentioned, they will do anything to get attention from people and feel large. They want everything. Yes, and they want everyone to believe that they are everything and that they deserve everything. And it goes on and on and it doesn't stop except that it gets worse. And I really want to put that in out there in the ether. If you are recognizing these narcissistic tendencies and unless you get help even for a white hat hijackal, it is only going to get worse. 
I don't have good news to inject into that. It is going to get worse. So stop, get some help, turn it around, turn yourself around. So very important. Mark added, we were friends for a long time, always brought expired credit cards and then invite me to expensive dinners. That is something that happens a whole lot. You know, they appear to be so wealthy and yet at the last minute, they don't have any money in their pocket to pay for what they invited you to. I paid for everything for years, even though the family was rich, all the lying and gaslighting. You really do have a story, Mark. You've been through so much, but that's what they do. That's how they make it. They don't pay their bills. They expect people to not go after them. If they're sued, they tie it up in the courts for forever and a, and a year. All those things happen. So Ambient Calm says, one real quick question. I'm actively in a business relationship with a codependent who is in a narcissistic relationship. Very common pattern. They have shown some narcissistic behavior themselves. Should I run now? <laughs> and then there's a big LOL. Well, I understand you're laughing. That's what we call shadow laughter. Should I get away from the shadow? You know, um, if you're in a business relationship with somebody who's codependent, then they're going to try to hook their co their themselves to your coattail. So that's not a good start. But if they're in a relationship with someone who's narcissistic and they cannot exert narcissistic behaviors in their home relationship, so they want to try them on at work, I would cut, you know, really nip that in the bud. I would have very, very strong boundaries. And if those boundaries are not respected, then, yep, I think I get to the run place myself. I don't know what's best for you, but Lily says a narcissist with dementia is the worst. Yes, and I don't mean to sound cruel or dismissive, but if you're in relationship with a person who has a lot of narcissistic tendencies, best to get out early rather than late because it seems, and I don't have research for it, but there's a lot of anecdotal information that people who have strong narcissistic tendencies, um, when, they, when they do experience dementia, it really gets awful. So know that. You know, if you're if you are in a in a situation or you want my help to calibrate it, you know, go to beaclient.com to see if your situation has any way of improving. And if it doesn't have any possible way of improving, it's important to give yourself permission to get out of it because you don't want to end up caretaking a person forever and then have them go down a slippery slope of getting ill or having dementia. And then there you are, you're caught and stuck. And you knew you should have left when you were 33 or 42, but you're still there. And uh, that's, that's a waste. That's really difficult. And it's not something in some cases that can be fixed. So let's work together and figure that out. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. A big thank you for Mark. And Jody. Hi, Jody. I couldn't understand what it was exactly they took from me. It felt like everything, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Then someone said, they steal your hope, and everything fell into place. Above everything else, they had robbed me of my hope. With all of them, they repeatedly abused my hope. Without hope, what's left? Now that I know what they really steal from me, I can better protect it. No one will ever abuse my hope again. Very well said, Jody. Um, because when you're with a hijackal, you they hope that you will get hooked on hope. Hope that the person you met in the beginning, that love bombing person, you're hooked on the hope that that person will return. They will come back and they will, you just have to get it right and they will come back and love you. And so when you have to say, I'm going to give up that hope and face the cold light of day with what I'm dealing with. It can be really hard. So I understand that completely. And yes, you're welcome, Ambient Calm. And Lily says the narcissist who has dementia is a parent. Very, very difficult. And I'm sorry that you have to go through that. I hope that you insist on getting help, that you do not have to do it alone. 
such good conversation tonight. Thank you so much for being with me. And I am here every Monday night so far <laughs> at 7 p.m. Pacific time to do this podcast live and have an opportunity to talk with you. Please invite your friends. Uh, invite people that are in your support group, people you, that maybe you're going through a toxic situation. Invite people to go and listen to the podcast or the YouTube channel and understand what you're going through so they can help too and help from an informed way. And as usual, until we talk again, be very, very good to yourself. And you're precious. You matter. And take good care. Good night.